Manipulating the components of our mesh in edit mode is a really powerful way to make whatever shapes that we need to. But the one downside of working that way is it's inherently destructive. And what I mean by that is that it's inherently hard to get back to what you started with originally once you've made a substantial change. And let me show you an example of that. If I hit tab to go into edit mode on my cube here, let's just say I want to bevel all of the edges on my cube. Well, since I have everything selected, I'll just hit control B, move my mouse a little bit, and then left click to confirm. If I wanted to change these properties, of course, I could go to the bottom left and the redo panel and change the width or any of these other settings. But as soon as I do something else, let's say I also want to inset the top. So I'll take that and I'll hit I, and then maybe I'll extrude this downwards. And once I've made a couple other changes, it's gonna be really hard to go back and change that original bevel. It's certainly possible to get back to the starting point by maybe merging these edges together and moving everything back in, but it's going to take a lot of work and will be very tedious. In contrast, there's a way to modify our mesh in object mode in a way that's non-destructive or very easily changeable later. To see that, let's go back to our default cube. So I'll just delete this one and hit Shift A and add a new one. And we're going to take a look at some modifiers. So the modifier tab is found in the properties editor just below the object properties. It'll be the blue wrench icon. If we click on add modifier, you can see that we have a whole lot to choose from. And there's no way that we could go over all of these here, but I want to at least introduce the idea of modifiers and then we'll explore them a lot more in later courses. The first one I want to check out is the bevel modifier because that kind of corresponds to what we were doing in edit mode. So I'll click on that. And now that you can see we have a nice bevel all the way around the cube. Here I can change the amount and also the segments. So again, this is exactly the same thing that we were doing in edit mode, but now we can still edit our mesh independent of these changes, and this bevel is going to be applied to whatever we do. So to see this magic in action, let's hit tab to go into edit mode again. Now you can see that the wires of our mesh show the unmodified result, and then the solid shaded version shows the modified result. We can see this a little bit better if we go over to our modifier, and right here in the header, we can click on the monitor icon to turn off viewing this modifier in the viewport. But let's go ahead and turn that back on, and we can also toggle this second option, which toggles whether or not to show it in edit mode. So if I turn that off, then I won't see it in edit mode, but then as soon as I hit tab, I will see it in object mode. But let's go ahead and keep this on for now. That way we can see the mesh that we're working on and the result all at the same time. So to demonstrate how this is working, let's go to face select mode here and just take one of these faces. I'll go down to our move tool here and just move it along the X axis. We could also scale this or rotate it. And no matter what we do, all of our edges remain beveled. So this becomes a much more easy way to work because it's a whole lot more flexible. I can even add a loop cut in here, take a face, hit E to extrude that all the way up, and I can just work on a very simple mesh, but get this much more interesting result. So the core concept here is that a modifier takes your initial mesh and, well, modifies the result. If you want to actually apply your modifier so you can edit those new vertices, then we'd have to go into object mode here and use the drop down and click apply. That will get rid of the modifier, but everything looks the same. And when we tap into edit mode, we can see that those new vertices are now actually committed to the mesh itself. Let's go ahead and look at a couple more modifiers as well. I'll hit tab to go into object mode, and this time I'll add a monkey. Shift A, mesh, and monkey. The next modifier you should be aware of is the array modifier. And this one's super helpful. Let's just go to add modifier, and it's the first one under the generate category. This one's gonna create as many copies of our mesh as we need all in a row and we can change the count here. If you want to change the spacing, then you can change the relative offset in the x-axis, the y-axis, or the z-axis. This one's super fun to use because not only can we use a relative offset, which changes with the size of our mesh, so for example, if we actually go into edit mode here and scale our mesh along the x-axis, everything else will change in proportion to it. Instead of using that, we can also use an object offset. So if I uncheck relative offset and turn on object offset, right now we don't have any objects selected, so we need to create a new one. So I'm gonna hit shift A and then just create an empty, which is just a basic object with no actual information in it. It's just a location in space. And that's really all we need for this modifier. So I'll go ahead and select our monkey again and choose that empty as the object. So since the empty is in the exact same place as the monkey, then there really is no offset here but I'll go ahead and toggle X-ray so that I can select my empty a little bit better. And if I start to move this, then you'll see exactly what happens. The location of this empty is defining the location of this second monkey, and then it just extrapolates that outwards for however many copies that we need. 
This is a little bit more complicated to work with, but it's a lot more flexible because not only can we place it wherever we want, we can also rotate this however we want and scale it however we want. And just as before, we can go into edit mode for our monkey here, and we only need to change one, and we only need to change one of these copies. For example, if I want to shrink the ears or something. For example, if I want to give him a bigger forehead or something. Then it'll do it for all of those copies all at the same time, and I really only have to do that change once. I'll undo that though, and the next one I want to look at is the subdivision surface modifier. So I'll go ahead and get rid of my array modifier, and I'll also get rid of my empty. I'll hit delete. And let's select our monkey, go to add modifier, and choose subdivision surface. Remember when we talked about subdivisions in edit mode? Well, this is going to do essentially the same thing, but also smooth out the result. If we want the same result as in edit mode, we could just set this to simple. Then we won't actually see a whole lot of a difference, except if we go into wireframe view and turn off optimal display, then that'll show exactly what's happening as we increase the levels. It's just dividing the mesh into more and more pieces. Now, this is something to be really careful of because as we increase the levels here, it's actually increasing our poly count exponentially. So if you were to just click and drag this all the way to the right, you might crash your computer. Now with a simple object like this, you know, that's not going to happen, but things will still start to get really, really slow really quickly. So I would definitely avoid that if at all possible. Keep this in the zero to three range, but I'll go ahead and switch this back to Catmull Clark and we can see the smoothed result. And now if I hit tab to go into edit mode, I can edit a very simple mesh while the actual end result is a nice and smooth one that just interpolates between all of these different points. So if you're wondering how to get nice, smooth results, this is one method that you could go with. Now, there's a whole lot to say about modeling with subdivision surfaces and all the different techniques that might go into that, and that's stuff that we'll cover in later courses. But for now, if you just need to smooth out your objects, then you might want to just add a subdivision surface modifier, right click and shade smooth. And I'll hit control Z a little bit, right click and shade smooth again, and there we go. If you're coming from another program like Maya, you might want a quick hotkey in order to switch between different levels of subdivision surfaces, and we can actually do that with the number keys on the top of the keyboard. So if I don't have a subdivision surface modifier here, I'll just click X to delete it. I can hold control and then hit one on my keyboard to add a subdivision surface modifier with a level of one. Now if I hit control two, it'll give us a level of two. If I hit control three, it'll give us a level of three. Whoops, actually I hit control four. There we go, control three, level of three. And then if I hit control zero, it'll jump us back to zero, but it'll still keep the subdivision surface modifier. So if it doesn't have the modifier and you hit one of these keys, then it'll just add it for you. But you can also just disable it by hitting control zero at any time to see your original mesh. It's the only modifier that has a hotkey like that just because it's so commonly used. The other modifier that you might want to be aware of right away is the mirror modifier. And this is one that helps us do only half the work. So I'll get rid of my subdivision surface modifier here and right click and shade flat just so we can get back to our original monkey. And if I hit tab to go into edit mode, you'll notice that everything that we have on the right is the exact same as what we have on the left. Now there is a limited amount of symmetry in edit mode. For example, up here, we have this little butterfly type icon and then we have the X, Y, and Z options. And if I go actually to my options, you'll see mirror X, Y, and Z, and I can turn these on and you'll see that it'll actually just turn it on up here as well. So this is just a shortcut for that menu. But if I turn on X symmetry, then it'll try to copy movements across the X axis. And so if I just select one edge on one side and move it, it'll also move it on the other side. So this is edit mode symmetry, but it's incredibly limited in Blender, unfortunately. So I wouldn't rely on it too much. For example, if I take some faces here and I extrude them outwards, that's not going to be mirrored because it's creating new geometry and that's just not supported. So again, I don't really end up using this too much just because it is a little bit limited currently. Instead, I'll use a mirror modifier. So let me turn off symmetry in edit mode. And first I'll just delete half of my vertices. So I'll go to vertex select mode here in front view. Again, that's just one on the number pad. And then I'll hit Z, go to X-ray view, or you could use the X-ray button up here at the top right. And then I'll box select all the way up to, but not including that center line. So I'll just include all of the vertices all the way up to that line. And then just hit delete and vertices. So now we only have half of our object. Let me turn off X-ray view there. And then to get the other half back, I'll go to add modifier and mirror. Now when I tap into edit mode, I only have to edit half the mesh and everything else will copy automatically, including extrusions and insets and all of that stuff. So that's the way I'll normally work. 
One thing to know about the mirror modifier though, is that it works based on the object's origin. So right now the object origin is right in the center. So if I move everything off to the right, then it'll just split our monkey in half and we'll have a big gap in between. So if you're getting unexpected results, always check where your object origin is in relation to the mesh. I'll hit Control Z and undo that. And one other last note about the mirror modifier that you'll probably want to know right away is that if you're tweaking a vertex here in the middle, it's very easy to get it off axis and kind of overshoot a little bit or create a little gap. And so what they've done is created an option called clipping over here in the mirror modifier. Just turn that on. And that way, any vertex that's on this center line will stick to that line. So now I can't actually push it back or forward. I can move it up and down and along the other axes, but I can't move it past that spot. It's just stuck. That way I won't accidentally create any gaps. The one time you might not want this though is that if we take a vertex and we accidentally move it towards that edge and it gets stuck, then we can't move it back. If that's the case, then we'll want to turn off clipping, move that into place, and then turn clipping back on. Now I don't want to get too far in the weeds here on any one of these modifiers in particular. I just wanted to get you introduced to the idea of modifiers and the fact that there's a really powerful non-destructive system for editing your objects in Blender. I guess the last note that I should make here is that you can stack modifiers on top of each other. So this is called the modifier stack, and so far we've only been working with one at a time. But let's say I add a subdivision surface modifier as well. I'll go to add modifier and subdivision surface. And now both of these are working together. We can see that the order of the modifiers does in fact matter though. So first it's applying the mirror modifier, and then it's applying the subdivision surface modifier. If I click and drag on these little dots here on the right and place the subdiv above the mirror modifier, then we're going to get a slightly different result. And that's because first we're subdividing and smoothing only half of the object, and then we're mirroring that over. So the center line no longer gets smoothed. But if I wanted to smooth that out, then I could just place the subdivision surface modifier under the mirror modifier, and then it smooths the result of the mirror modifier. So again, the first one gets applied and then the second one. We'll talk a lot more about modifiers in the following courses, so I wouldn't worry about them too much for now, but do go ahead and try out the ones mentioned in this video though. Then in the next lesson, we'll take a little bit of a step back from modeling and talk about some more features of Blender as a whole.